Hello everyone! In this video, I'll give you an introduction of how to program with Python. If you are new to Python programming or computer programming in general, this video is for you. Python is often listed among the most popular computer programming languages in the world. If you are new to computer programming, it's an excellent language to begin learning due to its easy syntax and wide applicability to the numerous applications that range anywhere from data science to mathematics to my particular area of interest, Geographic Information Systems or GIS. In this video, I assume that you have no background in any computer programming language and I present the topics accordingly. Once you learn a computer programming language like Python, I think that you'll find you'll be able to transfer the ideas from Python to other computer programming languages, such as Java or C++. Computer programming languages are very much like music. Once you learn how to play one instrument, it makes it easier to learn how to play another instrument. If you have some existing experience with computer programming, take a look at the description below to jump ahead to topics you may not be familiar with, or at least not familiar with in terms of using Python. Topics discussed in this video will include installing Python and using a Python IDE or integrated development environment, basic computer programming concepts applicable to any computer programming language, such as variables, lists, conditional statements, looping, definitions, error handling, import statements, and basic object-oriented concepts such as classes, objects, events, and methods. And finally, you'll learn a little bit about some of the standard Python libraries. I finished the lesson with some examples of common tasks you can do with Python computer code, such as downloading files from the internet, file input and output or IO, parsing comma separated values or CSV files, and I'll also show you how Python can work with other software packages such as the open source QGIS Geographic Information System software. Of course, one language can't teach you everything there is about Python, so I give you plenty of ideas on how you can learn more about Python through data science applications. Through this entire video, I will use a free and open source Python software package so you can get started right away learning how to write Python. Links to the software and code I use are available in the descriptions below. If you enjoy this video, please hit the like button, share this video, or consider subscribing to this channel. Okay, let's go learn how to code with Python. Hello and welcome to this introduction to Python programming. Before we begin, I just wanted to mention that it's important to note that the audience for this lecture video are people with no previous computer programming experience. If you have experience with other computer programming languages such as Java or C++, I think you'll find a lot of these concepts familiar and possibly a recap of what you already know and certainly how these concepts are used in Python if you're new to Python specifically. The learning objectives for this lecture are to understand how to install Python and use an IDE or integrated development environment, understand basic computer programming concepts such as variables, lists, conditional statements, looping, definitions, error handling, import statements, basic object-oriented programming concepts and classes, and standard Python libraries. I'll also show you some common tasks you can do with Python computer code, such as getting content through the internet, file input and output or IO, comma separated values or CSV parsing, and also analyzing the content of CSV files. I'll also give you a brief demonstration of using Python inside of another software package known as QGIS. Finally, I'll leave you with some ideas on where you can go next with Python after learning about these various foundations. Python is a modern, open source, cross-platform computer programming language. 
It is perhaps one of the most popular languages used in the world today. It is often used for tasks ranging from scripting of data processing, task automation in other software, and more commonly nowadays, artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's also a really excellent first computer programming language to work with due to its easy structure and syntax. Python can be downloaded using a variety of tool sets. In this example, I'm going to use the default Python environment that comes from the Python website itself. And we're going to use an IDE or integrated development environment called idle, which ships directly with Python to download Python. Simply go to the Python download website and click the download Python 3.81 or whatever the newest version is when you're watching this video. In my example, I'm going to use windows and it's simply an executable that you download and install. And in just a moment, I'll show you how to start writing code using the idle Python environment that ships directly with this particular download. A link to this website is also available in the video comments below. Before we do some hands-on demonstrations, let's first cover some of the basic concepts behind writing computer code. One of the most important concepts is the idea of variables. Variables are containers for representing values. For example, here, a variable called map name has the value my map. Variables in turn come in many forms of what are known as data types. You may already be familiar with the concepts of data types from programs like Microsoft Excel. Common variable data types include strings, which represent text characters like seen in this example, numbers, which can come in the form of integers like seen here in the variable map width that has been assigned the value 12, Boolean values for true, false, and many others. Another fundamental concept in computer programming is the idea of comments. Comments are used to document code and are not evaluated when the code is run. The arrow here is pointing to an example of a comment. In this case, the comment with the pound character is indicating that the variable low is of the integer data type. Throughout the entire lesson, I'll give you a hands-on demonstration of every concept. I'll try to keep the coding relatively short so you don't get too overwhelmed right away. And as to mention, all of the code files used in this lecture can be found from my website. See comments in the link below to download these files. Let's start with writing some variables and some comments. So as I said previously, I'm going to use the idle environment that ships right with Python. To access that, I'm going to go on my Windows system, go under P for Python, Python 3.8, which is what I downloaded for this lesson. I'm going to open up idle right here, Python 3.8. Now what you get right away is the Python shell, and this is where the actual code will be executed and run. And I'm just going to adjust my window a little bit so it fits better. And then to actually write code, I'm going to go file, new file, and that brings up kind of like a notepad type environment. And we'll put the two side by side. So the first thing we'll do is a string. So I put pound character to start a comment and I wrote the word string and notice how it turned the color red. And I'm going to use a variable, I'm going to call it map area, and I'm going to call it Rochester. So even with those two lines, I have a comment, a variable, and I've assigned it a value of Rochester. And note the use of the colors. I can follow that same idea with an integer. and so forth. Now, a common thing I'm going to do in this entire lesson is use what are called print statements just to show you what's happening here. So in this case, I'm going to have it print out the variable map area. So it's untitled. I first need to save it. And I'll use ctemp throughout the entire lecture. And with that, now I'm going to run this. So I'm basically going to take this computer code and send it into the shell and have the shell execute and read it. So when I go run module, you can see here my file got ran and it printed out my value Rochester. So that's a quick example of variables and comments. 
A few things I also wanted to mention right at the beginning of learning how to write computer code are operators, escape characters, R for what is known as raw strings, and a little bit of debugging in the IDE. So what I mean by operators, like you see in this example, in the fifth line down where it says hello world, I'm using the plus character to combine two strings into one string. And that can work for both addition and what's called string concatenation. Escape characters are when you use reserved words that normally would be processed. A good example of that is using an actual quote character. Notice how the quotes here are used to define a string, but if you need a string that contains a quote, it will use an escape character. R is a switch that you put in front of a very long string so you don't actually have to worry about using escape characters sometimes. Most of these examples are, are best demonstrated using a hands-on demonstration that I'll do now. I'll give you a selection of operator and other concept examples. The actual code file has many more examples in it. So again, I'm going to go back to my Python environment, Python shell that is, and I'm going to open up a new file. And let's take a look at some of the operators. So in this case, I'm going to put two strings in. One's going to be called hello. And the other one's going to be called world. And then I'm going to stick them together using the plus operator. like that. So I type the string variable hello plus and then I'll put a blank space and I'm going to then have it print that out and remember you always have to save it before you start Okay, so let's run it. Now, if this works correctly, we should see over here the string hello space world print out. And there it is. So again, created two string variables, hello and world, and then a third variable, hello world, to combine them together. And if you're new to computer programming, hello world is often considered the first program, so I followed the tradition there. Um, just to show you, of course, some other operator that's combining strings but I could do another variable say if I want to do some math and let's say I want to comment out this line here and there did the addition of 2 plus 2 so you have all kinds of different operators that are available. Look at the Python documentation and code file where I have many of them. For example, this one is known as For example, this one is known as the equivalence operator. where it's going to compare the values of two things. So notice I use two equal signs, where one equal sign is the assignment of a value to a variable. Two equal signs checks for equivalence. And this should print out, print false. Because of course one is not literally equal to two and so forth. Let me also show you real quick how to do debugging. Debugging is the idea that as you start to write more complicated code, you might want to check variables and so forth. So if I go over to the shell and hit debug and turn on debugger and you get another window that comes up and 
I can then highlight a line and do set breakpoint. And another thing too under your options is show line numbers and that will give you a, a sense of where things are happening. So now when I run this code, watch what will happen over in the debugger control. It's basically telling me everything that's kind of going on with this code and I can step into it line by line. If you look at the line numbers happening here and so forth, you can see too my variables and what their current values are, hello and world. It jumped down to line eight and so forth. And this can be really helpful for looking at what's happening with your code and so forth. And this is common in all kinds of programming languages and so forth. So that's the debugger control, just to mention that with a breakpoint. Lists are a special type of variable that contain a collection of objects. Lists are sometimes known as arrays in other computer language contexts. For example, you might see a list of distances that will be used for determining travel time as seen in this code example. In this example, note how there is a variable called distances, then an equal sign, and then a bracket containing three items within the list that are separated by commas followed by a closing bracket. This particular syntax is important as if this exact syntax is not followed, the computer code will not run. Lists can be of any variable data type. In that example of distances, those are three integer variables. In the example of distances, three integers are part of the list. Above it is another list called feature classes that contains a list of roads. Note in the bottom too, the index of list items. If you're new to computer programming, one of the most foundational ideas you can learn is that counting often starts with zero. So if you want the very first item of a list, you access it by its position of zero within the list. Lists are very valuable for storing sets of values that can then be examined using a technique called iteration or looping that we'll talk about in just a moment. But for now, let's try writing out some lists ourselves using Python code. So again, I'm going to bring back the idle environment. I'll open a new file up. And I'll call this one lists. And I'll put a comment in to indicate what it is. And I'll create a list variable called feature classes. And again, just to practice the syntax, you want a bracket. This one will be strings. So I'll put one called roads, a comma, and another one called water. And then I'll do another one called distances. And again, with the brackets, So that is your basic form of a list, bracket with comma separated values inside of the brackets. Now to reference a list item, like I said earlier in the concept discussion, you have to refer to the index. So in this case, if I want the first element of distances, I use a bracket, it's index or position, and format it like that. So when I go and run this, I should see if it works correctly, I should see 100 printout because that's z 0, 1, 2 in terms of an index. And there we go, there's the 100. Now if I change that to a 2, it should print 300 because again, 0, 1, 2 in terms of index. Okay, so that's the basic idea of a list and we'll definitely be seeing a lot more of these later in the lecture when we do looping and other things that really require you to go through lists or collections of data values. Another very core computer programming concept is the idea of a dictionary. Dictionaries are similar to lists with the key differences being that items within the collection of a dictionary are referenced with a key and value pair and they're unordered 
and individual elements can be indexed by the key value. This code shows a basic dictionary written in Python syntax. The string title is a key that's associated with the value Rochester. Dictionaries can be any collection of data types referred to by a key value. As you'll see in this example, I actually have a list as one of the values of this dictionary. In this case, some coordinate values. Let's try creating some dictionaries. I think you'll find they're very similar to lists. So I've created a new file. And to recreate the code I saw, I'm going to create a um, dictionary called Map Properties. And you have to be a little careful with the syntax here. It is a little different, but not too much different. So in this case, I'm going to use curly braces. So I'll put a curly brace to start and a curly brace to end. And note how the indentation starts. We haven't really talked about that yet because we've only done really simple one line things but a big part of Python is the indentation. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute when we get to conditional statements. So to start your, your dictionary though, you create a key using a string and then a colon and then whatever you want it to be. And then use a comma to separate it. And you can see here that um, I'm mixing strings and I'll put a numerical value in and so forth. And don't forget the comma over here. And if I want to access something from the list, I refer to it by its string value like that. And so if it runs correctly, I should see the word Rochester print out on the shell here. And it worked good. Yep. So that's the general idea behind a dictionary. I think as you do more coding, you'll find that dictionaries give you a little more flexibility in terms of storing data content based on the kind of objects or things you're working with. Another core idea of computer programming is the idea of conditional statements. This is the idea where values are determined for true or false values using what are known as if then else statements. Based on the condition found, a decision can be made as to how the program will proceed or take action. In this code example, a conditional statement is being used to check if a value of 1 is less than the value 2. Since this statement evaluates as true, the line that immediately precedes the true statement will be run. In this case, it will be printed to the command line that true 1 is less than 2. In the event, however, that the statement on line 1 was false, the code will then run after the condition that has been set for the expression to be evaluated as false, as seen by this else statement, which in this case, because the original statement evaluated as false, it will print false one is more than two. Conditional statements are very important techniques for checking conditions and making sure that you have clean, efficient code that can handle a wide variety of situations you may not have been able to anticipate at the time when writing your code. So let's practice doing some conditional statements, and this will also be a good practice in working with Python's indentation. So I'm going to create a new file, and it's always good practice to save your file right off the bat and save often. And I'll call this one conditional. And let's type a simple if else statement. 
So using the example I showed earlier, I'll type in if, and notice how the color changes. One is less than two. And now with this one, you put a colon in. And notice when I hit the enter key, watch what the cursor is going to do. Notice how it automatically tabbed in. Now when I hit for the opposite, for the false part of it, notice where the cursor is, I have to back up and take the indent back and use the keyword else, put a colon, and notice how now the cursor goes down. I'll save the file and run it. And because the value of it is true, it printed true. Again, a very simple amount of code, but it's important key things here are the colons and the indentation. If you were to back up and save it, you're gonna get um, a syntax error. And we'll talk about fixing those and stuff later, but that's just something to be aware of um, as you go on with your code. If you put the indent back in, it works out good. Iteration or looping is the idea of going through all the objects in a list and doing some kind of operation on the current item that is being examined from within the list. Iteration comes in many forms depending on the type of iteration that is needed. For ease of discussion, we'll focus on what's called a for loop. The following code example shows a basic for loop. The for loop can be described in verbose English language as follows. A list variable called FC list contains three string objects, A, B, and C. In the second line, the for loop is started as indicated by the word for. A new variable called FC is then declared. The FC variable will receive the contents of each item from the list variable feature class as each item in the list is iterated on. Another way you can think of this line is to say that for every item in FC list, give me the current item. Then in the third line, the current item from the list is printed to the command line as seen by the variable FC being referenced in the print command. Looping is a very powerful way to move through large numbers of objects and perform tasks such as counting. Let's practice now writing a simple loop and I'll also show you another kind of loop that I didn't talk about in the concept discussion, but it's also important. It's called a while loop. So I've got the shell open. I'll create a new file. And I'll save it in my same spot I'm always saving. And a basic for loop. I'll put a comment to indicate what it is. FC list, which from my mapping world stands for a feature class. And I'm going to make a list that we've already learned about with three strings. That looks like that. So remember the brackets and then comma separated values inside your list. And then the actual loop, we type the reserved or keyword called for. Notice how it turns orange. And I create a sort of I might call it an on the fly variable. Um, I'm declaring it just like this for FC in and then FC list my items from above. And like the conditional statement, I'm going to put a colon in and that's going to cause an indent. So this is another one to watch out for with uh, indentation as Python will get uh, mad at you if you don't do it correctly. And that's basically it. I declared the list variable. I set up the loop and it has one line of execution. So if I save that and run it, we should see ABC print out to the command line here. And it did. So one is basically three iterations of the loop because of the th it goes through, accounted through the first one, the second one, and third one, and printed their variables out. Now, another type of loop is what's called a while loop. And this will run until a condition is met. And this will use some of the ideas um, kind of of conditionals that we 
heard about earlier. So I'm going to create a variable here called x. I'll make it equal to the value of 0. And then the word here is going to be while. And notice how it turns orange like the word 4 did. And I'm going to tell it well, while x is less than 5, that's one of those operators, I want you to print the value of x. And then if I don't put another statement, this will actually run forever. So what you do with a while loop is you have to do some kind of increment. So I set it x equal to 0 to start, and I'm telling it to run until while x is less than 5. And I'll do that. So what this means is take the value of x whatever it currently is, so it'll start out at 0, and then when it gets there, add 1 to it. So the first time around, it's 0, then 1, then 2, then 3, then 4. Eventually, when it gets to 5, it'll no longer be less than 5, and that'll stop the loop. So we should see 0 through 4 print out on the command line, and this is a good case, too. If I don't want to use this stuff, I'll, do, I'll block those out, comment out that whole thing, because I don't need it. I just want to focus on this. So again, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, because I started the while loop with 0, and then it started and it kept going around and around. And every time it went through an iteration, it added 1 to the value of x until the condition got met, and then it stopped. So that was an example of a for loop, which is good for iterating through a predetermined list, and also a while loop that will run potentially indefinitely until some kind of condition is met. And you define what that condition is right here. Another really fundamental computer programming concept in Python and other languages are functions. You can think of a function as a small mini program that does something. And some core ideas with functions are that functions can receive arguments or inputs, and they can sometimes return values back. So think of it as an input and an output. So let's, let me walk you through an example of a function. If I look at this code right here, there's a simple two-line function called addition. And addition takes two inputs, a number one and a number two, and then we'll add those two numbers together. So to actually use the function, I have two input variables. Let's say my salary and my tip. It's a special function to determine how much money I made each year. And so later in the code, I send those two input variables into the function call. So notice how the word addition has two arguments coming in. And this particular function is going to return a value back that I'll just talk about. So the way it works here is I'm calling the addition function. So I'm sending those two numbers into that function. They're then going to be processed with addition and sent back through the return statement. And that will then print the value 1,500 on my command line because I sent in 1,500 that get added together in the function. And this is the basic process for most functions where they're defined, you call them, and they either return a value or not, depending on what you want them to do. So let's practice coding out that function. So again, I have my shell open. I'll create a new file. And to set up, you first define the function. Usually, you put it at the top of your code. And we're going to see a new keyword, DEF. Notice how it turns orange, just like we saw with for loop, while loops, and if-then-else statements. And I'm going to call this one a simple addition function. And I set up parentheses for my input arguments. And you separate those values out. And you have to use a colon. And again, here's where we're going to see indentation coming again. So it indents it out, and then I'm just going to tell it, return, and that's basically it. So number one, number two get sent in, they get added together and sent back out. Later in the lecture, I'll talk about error handling and so forth because things don't always work as nicely as they will when I'm uh, coding like this and let's how let's use the function
So these can be any variables you want. And in this case, I'm actually going to create a variable called result, and result is going to be equal to me calling addition and sending in my two variables or arguments more properly. Okay, so I've got two variables. They're going to be sent into the function addition, and then addition is going to add them and send them back. And then what's sent back, it's put in the variable result, and then result will print to the command line. So if everything goes according to plan, I should see 1,500 come out on the command line. And it worked good. Now again, this was meant to be a very basic function to show you the, the concept of how these things work together. We're going to revisit this one as we add more things to it in terms of error handling and so forth. So hold on to this one in particular if you're uh, going to be doing more coding throughout this lecture. Another very common aspect of computer programming is coding for error handling. Error handling comes in two basic forms. One is a syntax error when you've simply type something in incorrectly and the other are exceptions where syntactically things are correct yet some kind of error comes up and then error handling is code that you write to sort of gracefully handle any issues you might find and it can also help users of your code and as I mentioned I'm going to use the basic function and modify it a little bit so that we see some error handling okay I'm bringing back the function that we just used. I'm going to save it as a different file name because we're going to modify this code a little bit. And for example, earlier it was all very nice and clean. I, I automatically sent in two numbers, they were added together and it worked fine. But let's say your user doesn't make things as nice and clean like that for you. So let's let's first add some error handling into the function. And a basic example of that will look as follows. So you type in what's called try. And if you're familiar with other languages, it's, it's basically the same idea. So try means try to do this. Try to take the input number one and input number two or argument one and argument two and add them together. Try to do that. And if that doesn't work out, This is what this is where the actual catching or error handling happens. Send back the word the, the string unexpected error. In just a moment too, I'll we're gonna look at what are called import statements where we can actually put a more robust error handling in in terms of the actual message. But for now, the key thing to know here, the try statement, note again your indent. We've we're three levels of indenting now. The the function definition, trying, and then the actual uh, execution, or it goes back out a level if there's some kind of problem. And then how can we break this if we try to do something like, instead of the number 500, it will um, send a string in. And so I'm purposely going to trip this up because it's going to send the number 1000 and the string 500 and when it tries to do this line to add them together it's not going to work and it should hit the uh, the error catch so let's see what happens here so if this works sort of correctly if this works correctly as you know unexpectedly we should see the word unexpected error come out to the command line right because again it couldn't add the integer with a string. Now, if I did something like, just for uh, the learning moment, if you don't put the error handling in, comment all that out, and we'll just grab this part here, and just kind of go back to the beginning of it, and run it, let's see what happens here. 
you get a whole um, sort of barf of red text on the string. And here's where it's telling you what happened. Unsupported operand type, you can't add an integer with a string, str. And that came out because I didn't have the error handling in and so forth. So if you don't have error handling, this is what you'll get. I mean, this sometimes is fine to have this. It tells you where the problem happened at line three. So again, remember you can show the line numbers and so forth. So at line three, it found that that's where the problem was and so forth and what the problem was. Um, but error handling makes it a little bit more elegant in terms of uh, handling it. Another fundamental aspect of computer programming in general are the use of imports and packages. And what this is going to allow you to do is work with different libraries or tools or functions that may not be immediately available in your code. And sys or system is a very common module that's often used in Python. So we'll do a demonstration of that building upon our error handling example that we just looked at. So as I said, we're going to revisit this example of error handling and this time use it as a way to learn about imports. So what I'll do here is I'll save my file with a different name. And I'll clean it up from last time. Now, in this case, I might want to be a little careful with my indents. Sometimes I like to, yeah, everything looks okay. Now, as I said earlier, the error handling was just, I'm sending back the string unexpected error, but you can use an import command to bring the system library in so that you can basically more elegantly have your code send back this kind of error that kind of just blurted out. So an import statement is really easy to do. And often is the, the very first thing at the top of your code. So I'm going to type in the word import. Notice again, it turns orange like the other reserved words. And I'm going to do sys for the system. Okay. And the way I'm going to use it is down here. Instead of returning a value back. I first set it up with a string and then I reference the, the system that I just did the import. And I call later what we'll learn about it as a method to get the system error. And it has a list of errors and I'm getting the very first one out of that error. So again, I'm using the sys, I'm getting the execution info method. If there's any errors, I'm getting the very first element or zero as we learned about with counting. And down here in result, I might do it a little different. Um, I'm gonna check the value of result. So I'm going to make the error happen again. And because of it's not going to, because I'm not returning anything, I'm actually checking the value that's going to come back. And in Python, you have this none or sort of null value. And I don't want to print anything. If some kind of problem happened, I want to have it just print the error out and not return anything. And then I'm checking down here. If nothing is coming back or none, don't print it, but if it is, does not equal none, then it'll print it. So let's run this and see what happens. Now I still have that error. I'm going to try to create the error. A thousand, an integer of a thousand plus a string should cause an error that then is trapped and then it should print a more, well, it's still going to be a, a sort of cryptic message if you're new to this, but it's going to be a little more uh, clean in terms of its output. So let's run it and see what happens here. And you can see that it actually did work correctly. So it told me that I had a type error. Now it didn't give me more information about it, but you can see that my word error got printed and then it, it sent back the things from it. Now, if I go back to the original state of things, if I make that correct, we should see 1500 because this statement is also going to evaluate the result. And it did. So again, 
importing statements. We'll see more of that in the longer demonstrations. This is sys. This is very common. You can use it to do more elegant error handling and other things, and also using some operators to do a little conditional check in terms of printing. I also wanted to briefly touch on some other important programming concepts. These are pretty big topics unto themselves, so this is a pretty gentle introduction kind of relative to the other sort of high-level introduction to basic coding concepts. And the first thing I want to talk about are the idea of objects. Objects are the basic building blocks of computer programs that use object-oriented programming techniques. Objects can interact with one another, do things known as methods, and have characteristics known as properties. For example, you can think of a car as a type of object. It can interact with other cars, it can drive on the road, and it can do things like stop and start, and it has characteristics like its color, make, and model. In the world I come from, digital maps are no different. A digital map can interact with the user, it has methods such as panning or zooming, and it has characteristics or properties such as the current map scale or the map extent. So with this general introduction to the idea of objects, let's take a little further look at the idea of classes, which are the computer code blueprints that you use to create objects. Classes are how you can begin to create your own objects or understand how objects related to a particular software environment work with one another. As previously stated, you can think of a class as a blueprint for an object. Objects are then created as instances from the class blueprint. The blueprint, in turn, defines items such as properties and methods that are given to values once the class is created. These ideas are best explained using an example. In this example, a car class will define the basic structure of a car, such as methods or things the car can do, such as stop, start, turn right, turn left, and so forth. Additionally, the car class will also define characteristics or properties of the car, such as its color, make, and model. When objects are created from the class, also known as instantiation, specific characteristics of the object being created are assigned. For example, a green sports car or a red delivery truck. Both of these cars are derived from the car class, but have their specific instances are very different from one another in terms of how they were created as object. These ideas are equally applicable to the instantiation of map objects for map classes. For example, when you create a new map, defining the map extent, the scale of the map, and the spatial reference and map projection are all used when creating the map. Maps will have methods such as panning and zooming that you're probably familiar with if you've ever used a tool like Google Maps. Another important basic concept in object-oriented programming is the idea of events. Events are the idea when something happens with an object often to the method that's being used. Again, using the car analogy, an event for a car would be turning on the car. When the car turns on, several things generally happen. For example, the car will check to see if the driver is wearing a seatbelt, and if not, an alarm goes off. In computer software application, events are things such as the user interacting with the program. For example, a common event is a mouse over when the user has moused over a given object, or a mouse click, which implies that the user has clicked their mouse on some object in the programming. Again, in the mapping context, common events would include when the map extent changes, which could in turn affect how map layers are drawn, or when the user uses the wheel of their mouth to automatically zoom in on a map. Classes can be created in Python. Python classes bundle data and functionality together, and you write the code to create a class object like I'll show you in just a moment. You also then create instances of the object using your code. And those instances in turn have attributes and methods. Let me show you now how to write a simple class using Python and then use that class with two instances of the class itself. So for this example, I'm going to create a new file. And 
And to start working with the class, you use the keyword class. Again, like we've seen in other examples now, it turns orange. And this one's going to be a map class. And whenever you create a class in Python, you have sort of a startup function that's sort of the initialization when the class is, is instantiated or created. And those are give you what are called instance variables, depending on how you want to design it. Again, object-oriented programming is a huge topic, and I'm, I'm just giving you a high-level overview and a, and a very small demonstration. But the way it works is you type a function, two underscores in it for initialization, and then you put the self word in, meaning that the, the instance of the class itself is being passed into this startup function. And you can read the Python documentation for more details on that. But right now I'm telling what this one line is, when you create an instance of this class, automatically give it a map name. And then from inside of this function, I'm going to define instant variables or properties as I described them earlier. So in this example, in this line, I'm setting the instance of the class, the map name of that instance, to be whatever the user passes in when they create the object. And then again, it's an object, so it has other properties. I'm going to give it a default um, value of a two-dimensional map. And I'm going to give it a zoom level. And think about that when you use a tool like Google Maps or something, when you first open it up, it has a zoom level. You have to tell it where to go. You can change it later, but it needs sort of an initial state, and that's what this is going to do. Now, let's take a look also now at creating a method in the class. A method or a thing the class can do when it becomes an object. And this is going to be a method called zoom in. And you have to pass the reference to the instance of the class to the method. And so that's why the self becomes the first argument. And I'm telling this instance self to take your map zoom level that we typed out earlier in the instantiation method and make that equal to whatever the, the user is passing in. Now, I'm not for sake of time, I'm not putting error handling and all kinds of other things in there, but this is a good example of where you would do this because you don't know what someone's going to do when they, when they start to use your code or even yourself. So that defines the class. And the indents are all very important here. And now I'm going to use the class. And I'm going to create a new variable called map1 that's going to be an instance of the class I just created. And to create that instance, I type in and then just check that it's working. I'm going to have it print its map type. So if this works correctly and I run this, all I should see is the word 2D come out, but I'll set things up here so you can see a little better. Right, so it worked correctly. So again, I defined a class called map it had some things it first initially did. I sent in right here is where I create an instance of this class. And then I pass in the map name initially when it gets created. So to show you more instances, if I create a second variable, and if I change my print statements around,
by the way, I should mention that when you start to write more complex or just longer bits of code, um, in this case, once I've run it, it already has in memory now the map class. So if I do, if I typed in map one and then dot, and then I hit control space bar, or just really control, notice how things are starting to fill in for me. So it has the class in memory. It makes it a little easier. Now I can just use my arrow key and kind of fill things in here. So in this case, I want map one's map name. And um, map two hasn't actually been sort of run yet in the code, so it didn't fill in for me. But this is to show you how there's two different instances, map one and map two. They're both using the same sort of blueprint of the class, but they're just being used in their different instances. And you see that. So the first one was map one, Rochester. The second was New York. Again, they're all using the same class blueprint, just different instantiation. And that's the basic idea of a class. That's a really kind of more advanced topic, but if you get your head around designing classes and objects and how they can be used, um, it really opens a, a lot of doors up in terms of programming. And this is what really advanced object-oriented programming is, is based on. Okay, in the next part of this lecture, I wanna give you some hands-on demonstration now of some more robust coding that ties together all of these concepts. I showed you all the concepts individually as this is a beginner introductory course on Python programming, but I think it'll also help you to see how all of this ties into the bigger picture of what you can actually do with Python. And again, I come from a mapping background, geographic information, so I'm always interested in data sets that have a geographical component or at least happen somewhere in the world. So I will show you that sort of indirectly. So the first thing I wanna show you is how to use an internet connection to get a CSV or comma separated file and then write that file out locally. After that, in part two, I'll then show you how you can take the contents of that file and do CSV parsing to analyze the content. And lastly, I use Python in the context of another software called QGIS, where you can write specific Python code to work with that software. So to start this part one demo, let's just give you a little background on what I'm gonna do here. Included in the Included in the comments for this video is a link to this website. This is from the US Geological Survey where they publish data about earthquakes around the world. And this often makes for a really good um, example data sets to work with. And so you see here how you have earthquakes from the last 30 days, seven days and so forth. And these are CSV files. And you can get the URL of a CSV file by right clicking it copy link address and so forth. Now, of course, you could just go ahead and download this, but it makes for a good example of just Python concepts with using different kinds of libraries and conditions and so forth. So let's do that in a coding example right now. Okay, so I'm back with my Python shell and I'm gonna create a new file for this. And I'll use the full screen so you can see everything here a little better. And for this one, I'll turn on the um, line numbers. And this one I'm going to save as Okay, so the first thing I want to do, we're going to draw on the import statements. I'm going to import the system. I'm going to import a new one called OS, which is the operating system, and that works really good for um, saving files out. So what we're going to do with this is open up a URL, grab content, write it out to a file locally. So a lot of times I like to define first thing as the root directory. And normally if I did something like that, I might have trouble because of the backslashes. So I'm going to use an escape character. I mentioned those earlier. I'm going to escape out. So I'm telling it in this string to literally print a backslash and I do that with an escape character and if you don't do that it wouldn't really work and the next stop I'm going to put a URL in 
And for that, I'm going to use the raw string, if you might remember. So the way that's going to work, I'm going to put the letter R, a double quote, and then I'm going to go back over to this web page, and I'll grab the URL for this, the significant earthquakes. I'll right-click, copy link address, and then I'll paste that right in there. And that just makes it a little easier to manage and so forth. And I don't have to worry about all the escape characters and so forth because I'm just telling it with R that it's a raw string. So just take literally the value of everything inside those quotes. So that sort of sets up This will set up file creation. Okay. And now using my import from the OS, I want to tell it where I want to go. And again, I'm going to be downloading a file and writing it out locally. So I'll create a new variable. and you have a method called open and you can see how things are starting to fill in now we didn't really see much of that um, before but here's all the arguments this is an OS method because of the import in the standard libraries and you see the name of the file the mode and some optional things as well so I wanted to open the root directory and then I'm gonna do what's called hard code it I'm gonna call it earthquake dot CSV and it, you have to put a switch in W means you want it for writing you want to write a new file out so again I'm gonna tell it to open the root directory here's string concatenation I'm basically gonna combine that string there with this string and then I'm gonna have it write the file out and I'm gonna use one of Python's standard libraries called uh, the URL library urlib.request and we're going to import another library called the URL open and now we're going to use a, a loop technique so we're going to tell it So using, we've just imported URL open, I'm going to pass in URL, the variable from above, and this is called casting it into a response, and notice the indent. Now here comes a for loop that we saw earlier, so basically it's going to read it line by line, for line in, and sometimes I get busy coding, I kind of forget to put the comments in, but this is the kind of thing, if you're new, to remember. And excuse my um, typos. Then you have to take the current line, and it's coming in as byte characters because of URL lib, and you have to turn it into text. And that's what this does. Into um, UTF-8, which is a standard uh, way that text data can be um, represented. And then I'm going to tell it with the file object that I created in line 10. And this is going to be the right, the current line to the file. Okay. So that puts it in the for loop, and that will keep going. Now to get out of that, again, you want to back up your indentations, and then make sure to always close your file. Um, it can cause problems if um, if you don't. And then sometimes I like to, you know, even just give myself some feedback. 
something, you know. And there you have it. So again, we'll save this. We are defining where we want it to go. The URL, we're going to obtain the CSV. Then we're telling it to open up a new file in the root directory with the name earthquake for writing. Then we're going to use the standard URL library to, to access that URL and open it up as a response, which is the same as if you visited the URL and your browser responded, but we're doing it in code. And then it's going to read in whatever is found in URL line by line. It'll turn it from binary into text and it'll write that line out as a file. Now I'm sending mine to C temp. If you look behind the scenes in C temp, here's all of the code files I've been, I've been working on during the lecture. We should see though, if this works correctly, a new file CSV get written out. Now, something I haven't shown you yet either is um, just checking the code. So sometimes it's helpful just to check your module. There could be something um, I did wrong, but no, it looks good. But what that would look like if I did something wrong, basic typos, like for example, um, I miss a, a, a quote mark there. And if I did run, check module. So end of line, when you know that's because there's a problem. That's a syntax error and so forth. So I have to put that in and so forth. But everything looks pretty good here. So let's go ahead and bring the shell back up. And we're not going to really see much because I don't have any print statements, but you'll be surprised how quickly um, that uh, Python is able to run. So when I go ahead and run it, let's just save it. So done downloading really, really fast. If I go over to um, C temp, there's my earthquake CSV that just got written out right when I did it, new file. If I right click and even just open it with a, a text editor, there's my content. So that all got written out. So it went out in the web, grabbed that content, wrote it all out as a, as a file. So that's a demonstration of using file input and output with the OS and one of the standard built-in libraries of, of Python URL to open content from the web and write it out and do something with it. All right. In this next demo will now analyze the file that we just created and downloaded in the previous example. So as a reminder in the part one demo, I showed you how to use the URL library to go and download and write locally a CSV file. Now let's say you don't want to use all the contents of that CSV file. You might want to do some analysis on it. So for some background on this, if I go back to the original web page, I downloaded this from you'll notice there's different fields that are included in the CSV, time, latitude, and so forth. If I look at the raw data, you can see how those are all in the first row as per it being a CSV, and then they're all separated out. So let's say I don't want all of this content. I'm interested in just values that are coming with the net field. And when you look at what the net field is, it tells you the idea, the ID of where the earthquake data came from. So it could have come from Puerto Rico. It could have come from the United States and so forth. So in this example, I'm interested in content that is only from us. So what I'm going to do is write code that will parse, will open my CSV, parse out its content and look at the values of the us field and only print out those values. And I'll use the part one demo to kind of get this thing started. So let's bring back the Python shell. And I'll bring back my CSV download and I can use bits and pieces of it. So is why I'm going to do this. And again, with any kind of coding, if you're new to coding, you always reuse stuff. You rarely, it's actually rare even in this lecture that I'm writing things out from scratch. That's typically what I do when I'm teaching, but in, in, in actuality, you often will you reuse things. So that's even a lesson itself. So what I'm going to do is called CSV download. I'm going to save as I'll call this one CSV analysis. Okay. So I'm going to use two of my import modules. I'm going to add a new one in called import CSV, and that'll allow me to work with comma separated value files. 
and I'll use my root directory. I'm going to just use the um, this file I just created a few minutes ago and I'll maybe change the comment and maybe I'll just comment that out because I don't need it and instead of a file out this time it's going to be the CSV file to to be read or parsed parsed means that I'm going to open it up and kind of chop it up and do things with it and I'll, I'll use um, some of my variables I already have I'm gonna call this one file in and that's going to be equal to the root directory and I'm just gonna borrow um, my string right here I'll use my string concatenation that I learned about earlier like that so this should create a valid path C temp with the slash together will give me a full path root directory plus the uh, the file in really not going to use any of this stuff I'll just kind of down just get it out of there um, now when I work with CSV files I often like to uh, define the fields that I'm looking for or I'm interested in you won't often know this sometimes you won't know this ahead of time but if you know you're working with the USGS data like I showed you um, this documentation on these things if you know that ahead of time you've got a regular structure it actually can be really helpful so I know that in the CSV coming in I'm gonna have a field called net and I'll give that a string value and I have another one called place and I'm putting them in uppercase to make them what are called constants or just that they're kind of supposedly not going to change um, you can leave comments in the video if, I, if I'm citing that incorrectly uh, it'll work for my purposes and I'm going to use a similar process now like I did with downloading and writing the CSV file so I'll create a while loop so while and then I'm going to pass in so I'm taking that in and I'm going to read it as a CSV file and that'll kind of give it its own special parsing as opposed to straight file IO and then similar like we saw every single line read the current line of the CSV I'm gonna create a new variable called current data and it's gonna use a CSV object that I get from that import statement and the dictionary reader which is used to get at all the, the key value pairs of the CSV file and so what this is gonna do is um, and get a dictionary so again key values and let me just make this a little easier to read it okay now we're going to loop through the dictionary of values for the current row so again behind the scenes what it's going to do is it's going to open up the CSV and each of these like in line one here each of those are going to be key value pairs so time will be paired up with that latitude and so forth it'll look for the first line and you'll be able to get basically a dictionary of the values and you learned about dictionaries earlier in the the lesson here and so the way this is going to look then is I'll create a, a for loop for I'll call it the row and now we're seeing a lot of the ideas we learned about earlier in this lecture come into play here so for the for the row of the current data the, the line of the CSV file and this one I will do some error handling I'm gonna to try to do this and sometimes it's good practice to as soon as you put something like that out put the um, an exception line in and we'll come back to that so here's what I want it to do though I want you to 
do a conditional check. So if row, and remember we learned about accessing dictionaries through their, their keys. So if the if that is equal to, literally equal to, and we saw that earlier too, I only want records from US that have the value US. So if that evaluates is true, print out where the earthquake happened. If it was reported by, and that's what the place, the place column does, um, is, is part of the CSV. So if that is not true or else, I'll just have it print. So again, taking the current row of the CSV file as a dictionary of values, it then looks at the current value of row net or the net column. It checks for equivalency if it's equal to US, and that's a little problem there, that if that evaluates as true, print out the place, again, that comes from that column. Otherwise, just print not US. And then um, we'll do a little more robust error handling um, and you can read up on the Python documentation of all the details of that but we're basically going to create an, an error object okay and then um, we're not really creating a file we can delete that from before and done parsing okay so with all that written out now so we've got import statements we've defined the, the root directory the file the CSV file we want to read in the fields of the CSV files we're interested in then we put that CSV file into a loop and we go through the loop and get a dictionary of key value pairs. And then we loop through those key dictionary um, value, key value pairs, and then look for the particular value of US. And if we find that, if evaluates is true, we print out the value of the place field. And again, refer back to um, refer back over to this stuff. This tells you, you know, textual description of, of where the earthquake happened. Okay. And um, and if that doesn't, if there's some error, it traps it, and then it gives a little message when it's done. So this is definitely where I want to check my module. Okay, so it found a problem. And the problem is, is that I forgot to tell it to open it. So telling you, while you're opening it, so open file in and make it into a CSV file, and then use the CSV dictionary reader and so forth. So that's why it's helpful to sometimes check your module. Let me check it again. There's actually another problem I did. I instead of while, change that to with. And let's see what that does for us now. I'll run, I'll check my module. And no errors. So that's good. So again, little typos. When I do these lessons, I'm I'm reading off of a piece of paper. I simply just copied it over. So line 20 should be with open file in as CSV file, and then the rest of it looks okay. So when I run this in a checked out, we should see um various places print out or not depending on the thing. So let's run it and watch what happens. So again, Python's really fast. So you can see that some of these earthquakes were reported by the US, their location, some were not reported and so forth. And that's basically the results of the condition checking. So that's an example of reading a CSV file, looping through its values, doing some condition checking and so forth. And that really pulls together a lot of the concepts learned in the lesson and from sort of those examples you could combine the previous example with this example and so forth but the important thing is to start getting you to think computationally about what's possible here all right the last demo i want to do is to show you how python works in another software program we're not going to type all this code out it's um, a bit lengthy but i'll just want to give you some of the gist of it here um, if you've never seen a geographic information system software, there's a lot of choices out here. 
And my whole channel really is dedicated to this topic. And I plan to do other videos on really coding for GIS. But this particular lesson is about Python in general. But for people that are interested in GIS, I thought I'd show QGIS. Um, QGIS is a free and open source software package. Um, I'll put a link to it in the video description if you want to download it. Um, to set this up, though, I'm going to go on my system and open QGIS, which I've already downloaded. And I'll put a link on um, one of the cards where you can find out more about GIS in general. Um, it's, it's its own big topic in itself. Okay, to get this started, I'm going to clean up things a little bit here. I'm going to move some of my code out of the way. I'm basically moving all of the stuff I did earlier in the lesson. And with the QGIS, I'm going to take all those data sets and put them right at the C temp directory um, just to make it a little easier. Okay. And from my new QGIS project, I'm going to add California counties to the map. That's the SHP. And I'll save it. And so forth. And I'll go back to my Python shell. And this time I'm going to open a file. Like I said, I'm just going to walk you through this. We're not going to code this all out. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my Python shell and I'm going to open up the file I give you that you can download from my website, QGIS Python example. And we're not going to code this all out. It's a lot more to it, but it's more to just demonstrate what's possible. So at one high level, it's showing you how to use Python with a specific software, in this case, a GIS software called QGIS. And just to kind of walk you through this, this code is meant to run inside of QGIS. So the current project is this, that I've saved it. And it assumes that California counties is the, the active layer. And that's what, you know, has its own um, calls for that. And then what it's going to do is it's going to go inside of that layer and it's going to look for the name of the county and again if you're new to GIS if you were to go back over here right click and do um, open attribute table each of these counties has um, attributes like the name and so forth and those have values so programmatically with Python any of this data you can actually get at using the Python libraries of QGIS and that's what this code demonstrates and then it's going to um, create what's called a renderer we will change the color of the map and it's going to create a map based on the population values using what's called a five class renderer. And it'll make those go from red to white. And you can study this code, um, the, the details of it on your own time. I'm just giving you an overview. And it'll update the map once it changes. And then it's going to go, um, assuming you have all of your data in the C temp directory, it'll add a new layer. There's that um, raw string switch. Um, it's going to then query for roads. And um, here's an escape character because we actually need to use quote characters when we run a query. And then it's going to do a buffer of the queried roads. And it's basically going to go through and create the buffer and add those buffers back into the map. So all that stuff it'll do in sort of one um, workflow. And again, I'm not going into the details of all this. This is high level just to show you how to use Python that it, that it can be used. Um, now to actually run code in Python, there is a plugin. And if you don't already have it, um, you load up the Python console and it's a way to write code, Python code inside of QGIS itself. Um, I've been showing you idle cause we've been doing more than just working with, um, QGIS, but you know, if you're, if you're going to use QGIS for Python, it does have a way to do it. And we're going to bring up the editor. And I'm going to go ahead and load up my script that I just showed you it was in C temp.
And when I run this, all the things I just described in terms of the display of the map, querying, buffering, and all should happen, uh, assuming there's no problem. So I go ahead here and run the script. And it went pretty fast. Um, take a look at what happened here. So again, it went through and printed out all the names of the, of the counties. It changed the display of the counties based on their population values. It added a road layer into the map and then ran a buffer on those roads um, based on a query. And if I zoom in, um, I can see that that's what these, uh, if I turn things off a little bit, or even move the roads on top, I zoom in a little closer, you can see how there's the roads got added and then those roads in turn were buffered and that's what those green things are. So again, that's just a quick demonstration of using Python in another software environment. Take a closer look at the code itself. And again, like I showed you with CSV and file IO, the sky's the limit in terms of what's possible with using Python inside of other software, whether it's a GIS software like QGIS or really anything else that's out there that uses Python as its scripting language. So where to next? In this video, I've shown you a lot of examples of core computer programming concepts using Python to get you started, but that's now the entryway into the bigger world of what's possible with Python. And one of the most common ways you can go beyond the relatively straightforward interface of, of idle that I showed you is to use what's called Anaconda. And Anaconda gives you um, numerous kinds of libraries that you can use. In this screenshot on the bottom right, you can see pandas, um, scipy, Jupyter and so forth. And these are all different kinds of libraries used for data science, mathematics, visualization, and so forth. So I'll put a link to Anaconda in the district, um, in the video comments. And next I'll give you a really very brief introduction to Jupyter notebooks, which is a topic that I'm planning to create a whole nother video on. And if you do other searches on YouTube, you'll find uh, videos on Jupyter notebooks and they are often used for data science. So let's go do a quick demonstration of Jupyter Notebooks that you can get through Anaconda. So assuming that you followed the link and have already installed Anaconda, if I look on Windows, Anaconda 3, 64-bit, you can go right to the Jupyter Notebook here, but let me just show you the, um, the Anaconda Navigator if you've never seen it. Here's what it looks like. And then from here, you can start to work with your different Python tools, and there's a whole nother topic called Conda that's used to bring different Python libraries in. Um, these are just a few of them. Like I said, the Jupyter Notebook, um, you can get it here. You launch that up. And like I said, I'm planning to do a whole other video. This is its own other big topic. I just wanted to show you that it's out there. It, it works using a web browser and um, basically a web server client environment. And you start writing Python um, by creating a new file And this is now a cell-based environment where you type statements in and they run. So let's start with one of the classics. So even a simple line like that, print, hello world, and you run it line by line, and that's it. And so you slowly start to build um, more and more statements up as you do more coding. So that was an example of a simple print statement. There's more things you can do um, if you, as you add um, more cells in, you can change the way the cells are um, formatted. So the idea, it's a notebook, right? So you have your um, code, you have documentation and so forth. And like I said, this was just a very quick introduction that Jupyter Notebook is out there. There'll be a whole nother video on this topic, but all that foundation stuff from Python in general, all is applicable in here. In this lesson, you learned how to install Python and use an IDE or integrated development environment. Specifically, I showed you how to use idle that ships with the default installation of Python. 
I also gave you a very fast introduction to Jupyter Notebooks as another possible development tool that you can use for more advanced data science applications. Stay tuned for more videos on Jupyter Notebooks specifically. The lecture also gave you a basic understanding of computer programming concepts, specifically variables that contain values, lists or collections of values or objects, conditional statements such as if then else, looping to count through collections of objects, definitions that can be used for creating functions that do various tasks that are needed, error handling for trapping potential problems in your code and giving your user an easier experience in case something bad happens, import statements where you can pull different libraries into your code that extend your functionality beyond the core libraries of Python, some basic object-oriented programming concepts such as classes and instantiation, and also some standard Python libraries such as the operating system and the system library. I also showed you some common tasks you can do with Python code, such as file input and output, opening contents through a URL, writing contents out to a file, and working with CSV files. Of course, that's just a small sample of what's possible with Python, and it's up to you to think about how you can think computationally about what's possible with Python. The following are references that were used in creating this lecture. Thanks for watching this video. I hope now that you have a good understanding of what's possible with Python. As a reminder, all of the software examples given in this lecture are free and open source. Check out the link below in the description to find out how you can access Python tools and the code samples that were used in this video to get started right away with learning about Python. And as one final comment, this is just the beginning. Please subscribe to this channel to keep updated on new videos hit the like button below, and if you enjoyed this video, provide any comments or feedback or questions you may have. Thanks for watching.